Hey, hey, everybody. Hope you're doing well today. Let's take a look at absolute poverty versus relative poverty and understanding the difference. And I broke this out into a separate video because I think it's really important that you understand what these two ideas mean uh, really quickly before you really dig into understanding all there is to know about equity and the distribution of income. So take a look. Absolute poverty versus relative poverty. What I would like you to do first is to get a thorough understanding of what it really means to be impoverished, right? So poverty itself, by definition, refers to an inability to satisfy minimal consumption needs. Okay. But beyond this general definition, there are different perspectives about how best to define poverty. What does that mean? Inability to satisfy minimal consumption needs. Well, what's minimal? What are the minimal needs of a person? And it depends on their society. If you live in a place where you need to have a car, then the middle minimum consumption needs is that you have a car. But of course, if you live in a less developed nation, having a car is a ridiculous luxury. You don't even need it. And the whole society could be based on an agrarian society. And so what's your minimal need? Okay. So what the way that economists have divided this out is that there are different perspectives. In one view, poverty refers to the inability of people to satisfy their basic needs. An absolute sense that is constant and unchanging, which is to say that these these are these are absolute poverty means that they people are fighting to eat, they're fighting for their basic needs, right? In another, poverty is a relative concept that varies across societies and changes over time. Okay, beautiful. So these two perspectives are reflected in two definitions of poverty, of absolute and relative. You need to know these and you need to know them well. And it's really important. It doesn't seem that important, I don't think, to some students. But these are really important in under, understand what to do or how to understand in a, uh, a society so you understand how to manage it. Okay, so absolute poverty, what's that? It's when a household earns an income that is below a level that allows them to buy even the basic necessities of life such as nutritious food, shelter, clothing, education, and health care. Jason Welker nailed this definition. That is epic. That is great, right? So they can't even, they're fighting to, for the necessities of life. I spent two years in the hills of the Dominican Republic as a Peace Corps worker. My wife and I moved into a house that had, had, had a dirt floor. There was no lights. There was no running water. And those people, my neighbors, who became my dear friends fought for their own basic needs, their right to a dish, nutritious food. They bragged about how they bought milk for their children, powdered milk for their children. One man would tell you constantly what a great father he was because he actually bought a cow when his first child was born and he ended up having that cow for five children and then it died and then he had another cow for his next five children because that way he could provide nutritious food for his children Right, which allowed him to spend his other money on taking care of the home, on clothing, education, which meant that he just provided them an opportunity maybe to walk to school, which is about four miles or eight kilometers away, and basic health care. That's pretty absolute poverty. When you're, when you're bragging about the fact that you can afford milk for your children, as opposed to giving them water, right, is, that's, that's, that's pretty absolute. Okay, so relative poverty is not that. Relative poverty would be to say, okay, so certain households in a nation can earn an income that makes them poor relative to richer households in a nation. And this is the kind of poverty that you might see. I mean, there's absolute poverty everywhere. And we're talking about poverty. So to, to, to generalize is, is incredibly flawed. But relative poverty would be like, okay, no, people are not starving. When you see people who you know are poor, who tend... Um, who, who, who it clearly is that they're not lacking the basic needs that they would need, like food, clothing, shelter, um, then they're in relative poverty, which means that they don't earn enough really to fully participate in the society in which they live in, right? They, they're relatively poor compared to others, but that doesn't, that's different than being in abject poverty or absolute poverty when you're just fighting for survival, okay? So have those two ideas in your head. They're really important to understand. Okay, so... Another concept, and, and, and this is something that you really got to get your head around, and a lot of it has to do with life experiences, but why do people live in poverty? And you will hear students say or hear people and parents say that, oh, well, it, you know, that's because people who are poor don't work hard enough. And that's something that really, really is inaccurate. Because if you actually look at the work that somebody does who is an hourly wage earner, say a construction worker, and how hard they work compared to me, as a teacher, now I might work long hours and I might invest a lot of my energy into teaching, but physically speaking, I am not working harder 
than a construction worker who is laying bricks all day or a roofer who's putting down shingles or uh, 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 an electrician or a plumber, right? Or somebody who's working construction on a road. I am not, quote, working harder and therefore make more money than someone like that. No, it's a, a lot of poverty has to do with where you were born. I like to think of it in the generational cycle of your family. So people who are born into a house, and remember this, people who are born into a house where incomes are low may have received little or no education. And as a result of receiving little or no education, they may have suffered in terms of poor health care and malnutrition. And they may have found it necessary to find work before completing an education. And I just tell myself over and over and over again how lucky I am that I was born at a time in my family's generational cycle of of wealth where the expectation was that I went and got a university degree. The expectation for my mother was that she got a high school education, education degree. The expectation for her father was that he went to eighth grade and learned how to be a carpenter, which he did. And the expectation for his father was that he got to be able to be literate. He was a Scottish carpenter and he learned how to be a carpenter as well. But he had a fifth grade education. So if I had been born to my grandfather's father, my great-grandfather, what would, have, what would my education level have been? It probably would have been high school, just like my grandfather. Why? Because that's when I was born. So when you see poverty, when you see people living in, 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 in lower-income areas of any country that you live in, you have to remember that what they're facing is different than what you might be facing if you don't live there. And the reason that's really important to understand is that none of us are better than anyone else. And as a result of that, if if I were born in the hills of the Dominican Republic um, to my good neighbor Luciano, guess what? I would have been a, a, a coffee hand. I would have worked in coffee fields and grown yucca and beans my whole life and maybe gotten a fourth grade education. And the thing is, if I got that fourth grade education... I would have been farther advanced than my father ever was, who would have been Luciano, who was illiterate. So Luciano couldn't read, so he was in the, he was in the countryside. If I had had a fourth grade education with his kids, got to sixth grade, they can go into town and get a job. That is a massive improvement in one generation. And if that family then continues, then maybe the next generation will be able to have a high school education and then maybe a university degree. So it's very, very important to remember that people live in poverty because of the situations they're born in more than anything else. And of course, there's situations where people don't work, and I get that, but not really, right? But not really. It has to do with the time and the luck and the country in which you were born in. And that's why you find yourself in poverty, because I would have found myself in more relative poverty if I had been born four generations earlier in the United States than I was. So the consequences of poverty include low living standards, lack of sufficient health care, and low levels of education. If you live in poverty, it's better chance that you will have a less of a low, lower, living in, lower living standards. As a result, you have less exposure to good health care and lower levels of education. And that means that there's a consequence to how productive you can be in society. And so... There's something called the cycle of poverty, and I would suggest that you really, really consider this and take it to heart. The consequences of poverty lead to a low level of human capital. In other words, you are less versatile or have less mobility in your job, and that it in turn makes it likely that people will continue to be poor, so the situation tends to be cyclical, and it goes like this. People are poor and have low levels of education and health care. As a result... They have low levels of education and health care. They are unlikely to find work or they only have access to low-paid jobs. And because of that, this or the low-paid jobs, they remain poor. And it can be a generational cycle. It has to do with your opportunities early in life, first and foremost, as a result of the, the, the generational cycle you were born in in your family. And second of all, and this is the whole big picture here, folks, the government's responsibility or intervention in the market to try to provide equity to all people in society so that they have a fair shot at equal opportunity, okay? So absolute poverty, relative poverty, the consequences of poverty, this idea of a poverty cycle, you need to understand because it is the underlying reasons as to why governments 
are motivated to get involved in the marketplace, disrupt free markets, so as to redistribute income to provide opportunities for those who can't earn it as a result of their current low economic status. Rock on, my friends. Keep thinking about this stuff. It gets super interesting. We got a ton of human stories here. We're talking about real people and real lives, not graphs and flatness. No, we're talking about the ability for people to have a chance to improve themselves and the government's responsibility or not to help facilitate that process. I hope you found this video to be helpful and we'll talk to you in a bit.